Hi everyone, thank you for joining. Uh, it's my pleasure today uh, to present you these results about the ENCODE project and uh, some of the results we generated uh, here at Integromics. So I hope everyone can can hear me now. Uh, and okay, so it looks to be fine. Okay, uh, if you have any issue with the um, with the um, with with the, uh, the the audio or the whatever, you just send us a chat, okay, and then we'll uh, we'll take care of that. All right. Okay, so um, let's get let's get started with the. Um, with the, the content of this webinar, uh, today we'll talk about the um, the exploration of the transcript term and uh, in specifically using RNAC data from the uh, ENCODE project. Okay, so first of all, uh, I will just I will just start by a couple of words about our company and product and uh, introduce the ENCODE project, and describe the context of this this project and. Uh, a summary of uh, the results from the transcript term analysis, and then show a specific example of uh, specific examples of the application, um, what you can do with our tools on uh, on these uh, kind of data. All right. Okay. First of all, well, a couple of words uh, for those who do not know Integromics. We are a software company, and uh, we provide solutions uh, worldwide. For um, bioinformatics analysis, and we um, we have collaborators in uh, large institutes and small labs, as well as um, you know uh, uh, academics and 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 biocomputational uh, groups, and we uh, also contribute to uh, scientific research by um, uh, collaborating in projects. So the projects we uh, we develop for the genomics application, the genomics field, uh, is composed of um, it's called Omics Office, and uh, it's composed of three main applications. So the real-time StatMiner tool for qPCR data analysis, the IBD for integromics biomarker discovery for microarrays data analysis, and this will be the, the talk today, uh, SIGSOLVE for next generation sequencing analysis. Okay. On top of that, on the Omics Office tool, we also provide within the Tico Spotfire application, which is like a interface for uh, result integration and visualization and data mining, we provide a couple of additional tools for functional analysis, for instance, um, and then and then uh, integ integration, comparative analysis of results. So these are the um, this is the, the software we we propose for genomics application. Uh, <clears throat> Now, to to present the context of the ENCODE project, uh, I guess you you you, you know uh, about ENCODE. So the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements in the in the Human Genome. Uh, the goal of the ENCODE project is to characterize all functional elements of the human genome. Okay, and here is the first trick. What do we mean by functional elements? So. Obviously, first, every, um, well, traditionally speaking, all of the genes, right? Everything that codes for a product in the cell. So this could be traditional um, protein coding genes, of course, as well as what we call non-coding uh, genes or, or RNA coding genes, all right? So these are, these are part of the genomes that are used to uh, generate products. Still, there are many more elements of the genome that are functional, yet not producing molecules. And this will be like the regulatory regions, okay? It could be uh, elements in introns or, or, or well, uh, promoters or regulate regulators, like a transcription factor binding site. And how to characterize this? So here, the definition of something that's possibly functional is that any region would be characterized as would be um, considered as functional if this region is able to generate some reproducible biochemical signature using a specific experiment. Okay, and this is a very uh, important definition here. So 
if doing chip seek experiment, for instance, you have a signal, uh, consistent signal across replicates in um, in different cell lines, for instance, then you will consider that this region is functional. Okay, so, well, for a couple of years, the, the whole consortium have been running many, many experiments um, and analyzing a lot of data, uh, obviously. So, broadly, you have transcriptome analysis. We trying to identify RNA regions by running RNA-seq, cage tags, rna pit, and so on. Then chromatin structure, doing uh, DNA-seq, for instance, pair-seq, histone-seq, and so on. Then identifying protein coding regions by using MathPEC. And um, and then everything that's reg regulatum, transcription factor binding site with uh, CHIP-seq, for instance. And then some uh, long range or chromosomal interaction, uh, phi C and, and so on. So it's a it's a huge collaboration. Many authors on the main paper that you have here. Um, well, there have been like 30 papers that that came out this month earlier um, in different journals. Uh, that was for the pilot project, and these ones are the the recent ones. And as you can see, this is just an, a snapshot of the the author list. So you know, um, I I'm, I should be somewhere in, in here in the middle. So you know, I'm just a humble bioinformatician in this in this consortium. Okay. So the the results. What what is interesting from from all of this data? The a couple of numbers about the transcriptome. Okay. First of all, the the gene code annotation has been a, a very successful uh, produ product for, from these data. Um, this is a highly accurate annotation that was uh, manually created by people from the Hazana team, for instance. You have 21,000 genes, uh, and then four to six alternative splicing transcripts per gene. Um, four to six because uh, it depends if you uh, consider just the coding, protein coding transcripts, or uh, all of the transcripts. So this will be the, the difference in this average. So uh, as we knew already uh, from the previous studies, only 1%, 1.2% of the genome is translated, is coding for protein, OK? Yet the vast majority of it, like three, uh, seven, like 70% of them, of the genome, is transcribed. Okay, with uh, three to six percent of the genome within exons. So, so this means that there's a huge gap between these two uh, values. And the results, the main results, I would say from the DN code project is that uh, something like eighty percent of the genome has been um, detected as involved in some reproducible biochemical signature, as uh, I said at the beginning. So. A potential function for most of the genome, uh, while we used to call, you know, uh, genome DNA junk, and uh, and for most of it. So this is something uh, interesting here. Of course, of course, the, um, all of these functions, all of these signatures, may uh, are not all char fully characterized in terms of uh, effect, but this is uh, a first interesting. Uh, Area of research, and then these annotation includes like some uh, seven thousand annotated small RNA, and this is a huge resource. It's very interesting because um, small RNAs have been, you know, uh, raising a lot, of, a lot of interest recently and in the community, and and this brings uh, many, many uh, new ones. Of course, most of them are these uh, four are these four types of small RNAs. So you have the small nuclear RNAs, the small nucleolar RNAs, the micro RNAs, and the, the tRNAs. And these four categories may make up like um, over 80%, 85% of the total uh, small RNAs. So uh, this gives, this, tell, this still lets uh, a lot of new molecules to investigate. Okay, so now um, we can have a look at the at the pa at the paper from the, the transcriptome uh, team here that was um, that was exhibiting and showing some of the um, 
like the general description landscape of the transcriptome. So this would be um, the representation of the transcriptome in terms of uh, expression level and location. So where, uh, so on the x-axis here, you have the expression level of the transcript, and on the y-axis you have the the accumulation in uh, nucleus at the top and versus uh, cytosol at the bottom. So these are uh, the different gene categories. For instance, uh, protein coding genes are um, highly expressed in general, more than the, the non-coding genes here, or than the new genes that were not included in any annotation before. So this is not surprising. The higher the expression level, the more likely well, it has already been identified, right? Detected. Now, sorry. <clears throat> now you have the, the the respective location of the of these genes. So, protein coding genes are uh, the, the transcripts are, are are present mostly in the in the cytosol, while we have the new genes or the the non coding ones that are a bit enriched in the nucleus, right? So usual protocols, you know, enrich for uh, polyadenylated uh, RNA. So that's why we uh, we find first of all uh, we al already found found the the, the these ones. So this is a general value, uh, general trend, right? You may have exceptions in there. So for instance, uh, in red you have specific um, specific expression level of some of the, the genes, like here, uh, MACTIN gene, the very highly expressed protein coding gene, where you have a stable expression and um, highly expressed in a lot of cell lines that have been investigated. And uh, if you compare this to a non-coding RNA like H19, it's a long non-coding RNA, you, um, you can see that the expression level of this um, non-coding RNA is much lower in general. So that's like the trend. However, if you consider some specific cell line like here, you have a very high expression of this non-coding RNA, right? So this is the idea. Um, and I would say we have the same uh, consideration to keep in mind when we look at results um, computing, for instance, the number of, um, of molecules per cell, you know, for, for, from a, an expression level like RPKM, you can deduce like, something like a number of molecules per cell, like one transcript per cell on average, this is still based on average, on cell population, right? So maybe one, uh, one or a very small number of cells had a huge number of copies, and uh, the, on average, on the population, then you get a very low average, right? Okay. So um, alternative. Splicing is often also been investigated. I'm going to skip that and jump uh, and keep on and stay on the, the small RNAs because small RNAs is something we 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 will look at today and um, we can start from these kind of results. So in the Encode project, we um, we have been looking at the different compartments of the cell and uh, the the small RNAs and the, the expression level of the small RNAs, right? So this is what you have uh, in the middle here, the respective uh, contribution of the, the different categories of small RNAs in, on, in, on to, the, to the, the total expression. So, you know, most of, uh, for instance, in cytosol, you have a lot of transfer RNA, right? And, uh, and many micro RNAs and snow RNAs. And of course, uh, well, most of the, the short RNAs in nucleolus are uh, from the category of small nuclear nucleolar RNA. So, so this is something that uh, you know consistent with the previous knowledge. And here you have the detail for every type of RNA. Okay. So here it's kind of clear that you have for micro RNA, um, most of them are enriched in cytosol, are present in the cytosol, and small nucleolar RNAs are more uh, enriched in nucleus. Okay. So that's fine. Now, what we uh, thought to do at, Indi at Indigromics is come back to some of these data here that was provided by the, the consortium and run our six solve and uh, workflow on these, these results to first, first of all, look if we can reproduce these, uh, these, these, these results, of course, and then look a bit further into the decomposition of the, the signal. So. 
to use that, we to to do that, we use some uh, resources that are publicly available. This is something you have access. Um, you 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 have access yourself. Uh, everyone knows the the UCSC platform with this uh, very uh, convenient and amazing um, genome browser, where you can also um, get access to a lot of data and specifically uh, encode data. Not only visualize them but download them. There is a, another one that's called the RNA uh, RNA-seq dashboard, which is uh, hosted in Barcelona uh, on the, at the CRG, where you can browse these this, um, different RNA-seq data and uh, the files and choose the one you uh, want to investigate. So, for instance, in this case, we went to the, the uh, HEP G2 cell cell line as an example, and we looked at the the short RNAs that were extracted from the nucleus on the one hand and from the cytoplasm on the other hand. Okay, As you can see, we have two files for each uh, condition. So these are um, duplicates. So we have biological replicates for the two, uh, the two conditions, cytoplasm and, and nucleus. And this is something we, we can use as uh, to 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 get more statistical power in the in the analysis, okay? So you can get the the fast Q files and the BAM files. In our case, Sixol works on uh, alignment uh, files, so aligned reads. And what we did is just um, performing a differential gene expression using the the entire RNA seq workflow um, from Sixol of small RNA from eight from the nucleus versus cytosol, okay? All right, so how to do that? Well, with uh, Sixor, it's very simple. This is like the main interface of the RNA-seq workflow. As you can see, it's pretty uh, simple. So first of all, you select the reads you want to uh, work with. So here, that would be the BAM files we have. Uh, here, there is uh, an option about strand-specific RNA-seq protocol. So that's something very interesting. In this case, we would check that option, okay? Because protocols are uh, oriented, like strand-specific. Then um, you select the, the genome, the reference genome. So the Basically, the annotation you want to work with, that could be a uh, RESTIC ensemble, so uh, that's something of your choice. Well, if you have some, uh, if you need to, to work on some specific um, uh, genome that's not provided here, like Drosophila or Mus Musculus or um, Mouse and so on, then you can just uh, upload and provide your own custom annotation. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's provided by the system. Then you specify um, well the, the the experiment design. So in this case, uh, in this case, you will have two files, and you assign them to uh, a group called cytosol, and then you create another group nucleus, and do, you assign the two other files there. So that's uh, as simple as this. And basically, that's all you need to do. Uh, right now, you can just once you do that, you can just hit the what we call the click and go process, which will automatically upload and process all of your data according to your experiment design and generate all of the results that are uh, that are set up in the analysis profile. And these are the results I'm going to show you right now. And I'm going to show this within the application itself. It's going to be much better. So I have the, yes, here. All right, so here, here is the, the kind of results you can get with Sixol. As you can see, you have the TIPCO Spotfire interface that's open uh, as a main window here, and you have different tabs, okay? And in, in each tab, you have the results from um, an analysis. And as I said, there are a lot of results that are generated by Sixol. So we can have a look at a couple of them just uh, to, to give you an idea about this. For instance, uh, well, the, the size distribution of the reads. So this is a very uh, basic stuff. Usually you expect most of the reads to have the same size, okay? Uh, especially if it's uh, Illumina sequencing, for instance, with a fixed number of cycles. However, it can depend on the, the specific protocol. And in this case, we are sequencing a short RNA. So the size uh, will depend on the uh, adapter, uh, the removal of the adapter, for instance, and, and so on. This is something you can, uh, you can check out. 
um, well, you can each time you can modify. So that's something I'm. Um, that's something I can. Uh, you, you may be familiar with if you know Tipco Spotfire. You uh, have access to all of the parameters. You can change the visualization. It's a very very convenient uh, platform for visualization. So you you can customize your results. In this case, we we um, we can already detect something uh, maybe interesting here. Although it's just a size distribution, there's nothing really uh, spectacular here. But for the for the, for the the samples, the the two replicates, okay, that that uh, that come from the the cytosol, you can see that you have a kind of bulge here, a bump of over 21, 22, 23 uh, nucleotides long. So this could correspond to microRNAs, you know. Okay, number of reads. So this is very simple as well. For every sample, you have the total number of reads. Um, you can split that by chromosome if you want to look into uh, this data a bit further. As you can see, all of the charts here are dynamically interactive. So you can zoom in into uh, histograms, you know, uh, bar plot, and so on, and and look at the uh, look in details at this data. Each time you select a data point. Then you have the the values that are displayed on details on demand. Okay. Then what? And if you want to export some results, you can do like this: export a picture, export a PowerPoint report of, or PDF report from uh, all of the pictures of your project. Okay. Let's go to some um, some interesting results here. Um, this is the proportion of the reads that are within uh, different regions of the genome. So you have the read proportion on the y-axis, so it goes from 0 to 100 percent, and these are the, the different, um, the different you know, genomic locations. So you, you, have, um, you can speak that by uh, strand or just look at the, the global picture. So first of all, the global picture, most of the reads are within annotated genes, okay, from uh, the cytosol. And most of the genic reads are within annotated exons. So that makes sense. However, you, you have a lot of reads that are within intergenic and intronic space. This, is, this makes up like uh, almost 60% of the genes, the, the reads, sorry. So a lot of intergenic signal, a lot of intronic signal. So is that consistent across replicates? If you move this bar, you go to, from a sample to another one, or you can display all of them on the same page, but uh, I like it that way. So you can see that it's very stable across the replicate from cytosol. Now, if we move a bit further and we go to the nucleus samples, then we have a much different uh, profile here. So that's already something interesting. If you look at this uh, distribution, you can see that you have much more intergenic and intronic uh, short RNAs, okay, short RNAs that falls in, in, in this area of the genome, in um, in cytosol than in the nucleus, when uh, where you know you have much more uh, exonic reads. And now, if you split that and you look at the sense and the anti sense uh, orientations, this is even uh, this is even more interesting, especially if you look into the coding gene. So let's add a, a zoom here, okay? And I'm gonna go. In, to look inside these different areas of the genome. Because the thing is that these, these are the exons that, you know, all of the exons. And of course, you have non coding RNAs in the annotation. So that's not surprising that short RNAs, you know, they, uh, they accumulate over uh, non exons. And in this case, I'm going to put this like that. Okay. So now we are going to look at the genes that are coding. Where we have three prime UTR, five prime UTR, and CDS. Okay, so we zoom in here, and this is the proportion, the proportion of reads that fall into these different categories. And in this case, what is really interesting is that most of uh, the reads that overlap protein coding genes do it in the anti sense orientation. And this is something that is consistent across replicates. You have this also, although the proportions are different, 
the, the respective balance of anti-sense versus sense is always in favor of the anti-sense. So this is something uh, in the cytosol, and now uh, if you look in the nucleus, then you'll get a slightly different pattern where the anti-sense is still true for the coding region and absolutely different for the, the UTR. So as you can see, just a simple uh, tool like this that, uh, that looks like a quality control metric, right? The distribution of risk into different areas can show you some specificities of the protocol, maybe, or potentially interesting uh, biology behind this. Okay, so uh, in this case, I'm just going to show another um, kind of analysis that's pretty much expected. It's the differential gene expression met matrix. So here, what you have is that for every gene of the annotation, in this case, we uh, we provided uh, like RefSeq annotation, you have results from uh, cufflinks and cufflinks uh, processing that is uh, used in SIGSOL. So, um, all the reads have been used to assign expression value for uh, cytosol and for nucleus in, in, in for every uh, gene, okay? And then a uh, statistical test is used to define if there's a significant overexpression or underexpression. And in our case, it will say if transcripts from a small RNA are more present in the nucleus or the cytosol. So that's the result here uh, with the, the volcano plot. So what you have is, is a typical volcano plot. I'm just going to increase a bit the size here. You, you can play with all of the, the parameters. You know, that's something very uh, easy to do. So we have we have a fold change on the x-axis. Every dot is a gene. So fold change meaning overexpression in green on the right. Um, so that would be a cytosol. And uh, uh, underexpression of cytosol, so that would be more on the nucleus on the left. Okay? And this is something you can check the, the individual uh, expression patterns here, where you have uh, in red cytosol and in blue uh, nucleus. Okay? So if you select the genes that are um, highly significant and uh, expressed most and present uh, mostly in the, the nucleus, then you can see that these genes I just selected here, while a lot of small nucleolar RNAs are present in there. So this makes sense, right? It's uh, what you what you expect from this kind of uh, experiment to get. Well, you have well, you have you know, mostly small nuclear RNAs in there. And, uh, well, in the cytosol, we should find some micro RNAs then, uh, if we do the opposite, yeah. And these are the ones we, uh, we can identify here in this category. Okay? So that's just an example. Um, of course, we can do much more. Once you select a subset of genes, you can select them, as I just did, by uh, marking them like this. You can also use the filters from the cosmophile. It's very straightforward to uh, just set up some threshold on the p on the fold change or on the p value to subset a set to select a subset of gene sorry and once you have a subset of gene then you can use the the functional analysis tool for instance to uh, to run a gene ontology or gene set enrichment analysis okay uh, specifically on this subset of gene here the question would be is there a biological function that is uh, overrepresented in this subset of genes, okay? So this is something you can run like that. Um, well, not the, the feature annotation tool, that's very convenient. Um, it's a, like a magic tool here. Whenever you have some uh, some gene identifier, and here, you know, a lot of people will, will uh, hear this message. You know, you have a gene identifier that comes from uh, RefSeq, for instance, and you don't have anything else, and you would like to know, like, the ensemble ID, the protein ID, it's always, a, uh, you know, it can be a pain to, to get all of this data. Here with this tool, you just uh, click on this tool, and you get automatically added and assigned the different cross-references IDs from uh, different databases. And it doesn't even have to be something from our software. It can be a list you have, you download from... Uh, uh, NCBI website or whatever, then you just upload it on in Spotfire, like uh, adding some some data table, and 
and then you can use this tool on uh, on this list. Okay. All right. The other tool would be like the the data integration of to compare results, differential expression results from microRNA from microarrays, for instance, and RNA-seq, or you know validate qPCR uh, results and uh, RNA-seq. So this is this is it. Okay, another alternative splicing is a nice chart, but uh, in, case, in the case of uh, small RNAs, it's not very relevant because we have only uh, uh, short pieces of the genome. And, and, and this, the last one, would be uh, the new genes. And that's very interesting because by default, we use only the genes that are provided in the reference annotation. If you select RefSeq genes, we are going to assign an expression value only to uh, RefSeq genes and transcripts. However, when you have reads that fall between genes, so these are intergenic reads. They could be, of course, they could be transcriptional noise. Uh, they could be, um, you know, mapping errors and so on. However, if you have a specific pile and a cluster of reads, intergenic reads that accumulate at some areas of the genome, it could be new biology. So it could be a new gene. So what we, uh, what six of those automatically is that not only it extracts all of the, these transcripts, we call them, um, as Kuffings uh, calls this. So not only you get the, the full list of all transcripts from the intergenic space, it also computes automatically a differential expression test for these specific regions. So that at the end of the day, you have not only these lossy, the, so these new uh, genomic areas, but also the the uh, the results from the statistical test are they are they uh, you know overexpressed and they're expressed and is that significant? So this is the the results you get from the new uh, regions and then you can identify potentially interesting regions of interest according to your experiment design. Okay, in this case uh, overexpression in nucleus and uh, not in uh, and not in in cytosol. Okay, so that that is something uh, that's done automatically. Okay, so this was for the first example, and uh, I believe you've seen that you can get uh, very interesting results here. Something something you can look at as well, and that will be the transition to the second example is the distribution of these reads with respect to genomic landmarks, and in terms of uh, Genomic, genomic landmarks, you have different sites of the genome, like a transcription star site, polyadenylation site, uh, splice sites, and so on. So what does that mean? Well, it's very simple. Uh, let me uh, just display one at the time here so that it can be a bit more clear. So here you have from a cytosolic sample. So these are cytosol, cytosol, and nucleus. We have more or less the same profile here. So this is this represents the, the density of the reads. I may increase a bit the resolution here that we, for instance, like this. So this is the read density over all transcription star sites from the genome. So transcription star sites or TSS means that you have the plus one, you know, the plus one uh, nucleotide of transcription here. So it's like all of the genes have been aligned here and at different position of the genomes with respect to this plus one uh, point, we just computed the, the, the density uh, in each bin. So each bin has the, the specific density. And as you can see, when you use uh, small RNAs, well, you have a specific accumulation at the beginning of the transcript. And, uh, and this is valid for uh, and then the scale of the entire genome. You uh, usually have an overexpression here. So that is very similar to, uh, well, that's something known, okay? Uh, it's not a new uh, trend. And that's something similar to what we get if we use the second example, which are the cage tags. And so what are the cage tags? Cage tag is a molecular process that is designed to capture the five prime extremities of the transcript and the mature transcript, the ones that are processed. So we usually when you have a transcription, so there's a specific modification at the five prime end of the transcript to protect them. 
that's um, that's uh, that's applied. I'm not going to go over the, the protocol, but you can refer to these uh, publications if you want. The idea is that you uh, you get some fragments of these that corresponds to this region, the, the five prime terminal region, and then the sequence. So these uh, cage tags, the sequences are specific to the to the five prime end, and these cage tags are commonly used to detect new promoters. Okay, and this is. What we did, we used a cage tag and we compare them with to the short RNA. So that will be another project I have here. I'm going to quickly, uh, well, uh, well, there are many interesting results, but uh, I don't want to run out of time, so I'm going to skip this. This, for instance, the, the size of the typical cage tag here, okay? Uh, we, com we can compare this to, the, to what we had before. And if we look at the transcription star site, Obviously, well, this is what we get. Cage tag are uh, cage tags are heavily enriched at the beginning of the transcript. So this is the, the TSS of all of the transcripts in the genome. Uh, in this case, we are looking at the different stranded uh, populations of short RNAs, so the sense and the anti-sense, and we can see that there's a, a bulk of RNAs accumulating uh, at the at the sense, and we have anti-sense transcription going on upstream of the gene. Okay, that's for the cage tag. And, and short RNAs display more or less the same uh, pattern where we have accumulation at the beginning of the genes, okay, and, uh, and a bit higher uh, antisense transcription, although here it's not really, it's not striking. So that is, that is something we knew already, okay? So um, a couple of reports have been have been generated uh, to highlight that. Even at the time, with uh, with former uh, my my former colleagues from Martin uh, detected that using tiling microarray. So where you have different genes, okay, and then if you if you put some short RNAs on tiling array chips, you have a specific signal at the beginning of the transcript, okay, that corresponds to uh, to the transcription <coughs> to the transcription star site, and. Uh, Again, this was characterized for the the sense uh, signal and the anti-sense signal, okay? And this is something we reproduced uh, using uh, Solexa sequencing at the time, um, a couple of years ago, where we had short read density uh, in transcription star site on the sense orientation and anti-sense a bit upstream of the gene. Yet we had many, many short RNAs and cage tags that were far from the transcription star site. And this is something uh, we can look at. So that's the, the, just a summary from a review. You can, you can check about the different um, types of molecules. And this is something we can be interested in. So we have a lot of, we have many cage tags that are not at the TSS. Okay, so if we look at the, the distribution within uh, into annotated regions, for instance, here we can see that we have, for instance, a lot of cage tags that are um, cage tags are here. These ones, we have many of them that are in, in intergenic space or intronic space. Okay, so this is just a proportion, but if you look at the numbers, it's, it's quite high. And a lot of them in three prime UTRs. So the idea is that, okay, what do they represent? Do they represent new transcription sites that have not been identified before? Or is that something new? We can look at something else to, identify, to, to answer this question. If we, for instance, consider the splice size of the genome and we look at the cage tags around these, these sites, we get a strong signal, although this is not supposed to represent any promoter. Here we are looking at the, the, the junction between introns from the genome and exons. So donor site is like the first position of the exons. So this is, again, the density of the reads from cage tags over the exons. So we have a decrease here because of the different sizes of the, the exons. We have a size distribution. But we see clearly an accumulation of cage tags within these uh, exons. And these are internal exons. These are not you know, uh, initial exons. And we have this, this kind of symmetric graph here with donor size. So what is uh, all this about? Well, there are 
two explanations, right? To, uh, to, that can explain this, uh, the, the, this result. First of all, it could be that we have, let's say, a lot of promoters that have not been yet identified. And these promoters uh, generate these cage tags. After all, cage tag is supposed to identify promoters. So that's the first explanation. However, there is an issue with this. Is uh, the issue is that we see a clear difference between intron and exons. All right. So why would all new uh, TSS be located specifically within annotated protein coding uh, exons? It, it's a uh, it's very strange. It doesn't make a lot of sense. So there is another explanation, and and it will be like the other uh, orientation of the problem. How could you generate a five prime end? So promoter is generating a five prime end by starting a transcript. Right? We generate. We, there's a transcription process, then we start a transcript, and there we have our five prime end that is capped. Now, there's another way to generate a five prime end of transcript that could explain this pattern. It's, sim in, it's simply if you take a mature RNA after splicing and then you cut it. If you cut a molecule, an, an RNA molecule, then you will just mechanically generate an extremity. At the, uh, you have two, two molecules and one of them has its extremity, the five prime extremity, where you uh, cut the, the molecule initially. And that could explain why we have accumulation of, uh, of cage tags here. Because, well, um, if you cut from a spliced RNA, then you can only have extremities w where uh, there, was, there were exons. And you cannot cut something in an intron if it's not there. So. That is the model we proposed, and of course it was a bit challenging at the time because uh, no, um, actually for molecular uh, reasons, uh, it's, there's no, it, 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 this model uh, uh, assumes that after cleavage you can recap uh, the fight from end and there was no uh, molecule, in, no protein in human known for these proper properties. So. This was uh, challenging. We had to uh, do some kind of validation of this model, and um, but we uh, we could identify that using uh, immunoprecipitation and then enrichment, um, uh, immunoprecipitated library with uh, antibodies against CAP, for instance, and this is how we could uh, we could prove that. So, well, the next. The last uh, graph that would uh, support this hypothesis is the one looking at the internal exons. And here we are looking at the, uh, the internal exons. They are here. So here we are looking at the density of the 5 prime ends of the reads, okay, within an exon, like uh, from 0 to 100% of the size. And there's a significant reduction of the density at the end. And this is because we have the reads that overlap exon exon junction cannot align on over the intronic space, and that's why they're gone. And this specific uh, signal indicates that these uh, these five prime extremities come from spliced RNAs. Okay, so that's just uh, supporting information here. So that's the model we designed. That we have intron, exon, intron, and uh, specific cleavage within the uh, exon that generates uh, this, this graph, OK? So we have a slightly modified uh, scheme of the dogma of molecular biology, you know, with the transcription and then splicing with a cap uh, maturation. So from here, you can have translation of the, the product into protein, or you may have a different uh, process, cleavage, and recapping. So cleavage generates long RNAs that, have, that are uh, then capped. And of course, the initial capping is going to generate cage tag at the beginning, at the five prime end of the transcript. So we, we, we have this, uh, this peak at the beginning. But we, also, we will also have short RNAs and long RNAs that are cleaved and capped. And these ones will generate cage tags that are located within internal exons here. Okay, so 
these are the two uh, models that we uh, that 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 can happen and that uh, are observed in these cage tags. And since then, in the ENCODE consortium, well, um, uh, the scientists from the the Recon, for instance, uh, where they developed the cage tag uh, protocols, are now uh, using are now changing the way they look at cage tag. Before we had you know the assumption that cage tag was only detecting promoters. Now we know that we can uh, get some recapping events. And now in the consortium, they use some uh, specific method, uh, algorithmical method based on uh, hidden Markov model, for instance, to uh, to identify the cage tags that come from a genuine a real promoter and uh, the ones that come from the from recapping events. All right, so I would like to uh, to thank very much my colleagues at Integomix that made this uh, work possible and that uh, yeah helped me getting this uh, this product in the hand so that now it's uh, it's it's great to to explore and to look at this data with this uh, with the fixels. If only I had this product before, it would have been much easier to uh, to explore this data. Then thanks to uh, Roderick Gigo and uh, and everyone at Barcelona at the CRG, and also uh, my former colleagues at Affymetrix, uh, Phil Kapranov and Tom Gingeras. And of course, and of course, uh, thanks to all of the members of the Encode, Encode Consortium, like uh, 400 and something uh, people. And thanks to you for your attention. So if you would like to take another look at this data, we have this data set. It's available online. Uh, we can send you the, the link. You can have, uh, explore uh, these, uh, these small RNAs from the ENCODE project. Yeah, um, there's also, there, there are also uh, different other data sets that you can uh, explore interactively just on your web browser. Otherwise, what you can also do is uh, also do is download this uh, or get a trial of this software and use SIGSOLVE on your own data set and, uh, and see what you get, uh, you know, as a result. So it has been a pleasure to, to present this today. If you have uh, questions, now I would be uh, glad to, um, to address them. So you can use the chat uh, window or the question and answer panel to to ask your questions. Okay. Let's go. All right. So, uh, okay. First question here. Okay. Does that work with any sequencing machine? Okay. This question is about the, um, the compatibility of the software with uh, the different manufacturers, I mean, the different uh, sequencers, I would say, if I get it right. So we have, uh, yes, so it's compatible with any sequencers because we start from the mapped read. So these are not uh, fast Q files, okay, as I, these are BAM files. So this is after you do the alignment of the read, then we, um, then you have positions in the in in the genome and this will be the input of sixol okay any other question Let me check the list okay what's the tool you use to perform differential expression um yeah the the method we used for the the differential gene expression and different uh, differential transcript expression as well is uh, cufflinks so it's based uh, it's a uh, well of course there's no uh, universal reference in uh, sequencing because it's a new area but we um we we chose cufflinks because it's uh, it's a it's becoming a standard. It's uh, popular in the community, and it's uh, very accurate. It's, it's addressing specifically the the issue of alternative splicing. So within its model, it's a uh, there's a, a log binomial uh, negative binomial uh, model that's inside. It's 
Cufflinks is uh, addressing the specific contribution of the, the, the splicing variants. So in the, the case of short RNAs, of course, it was not very uh, spectacular, but this is something that's very useful when you do full transcriptome analysis, for instance. Okay, And then you can get an alternative splicing report with not only gene expression, but also for a specific gene expression, the respective contribution of the, um, the, the splicing isoform so that you can detect um, you know, the genes that have been significantly uh, modified in their uh, alternative splicing pattern. Okay, more questions? More questions? Can you actually, actually see the reads on the genome? Um, yes, so it's not in the same window as uh, the spot fire here. But this is something you can see. You have the, let's say, you have a list of genes. For instance, here, number of reads per gene. Okay, that's another um, result I, I didn't talk about, but this would be like the total read count for every gene. And uh, if you select a, a specific gene, then you just right click and you can launch the IGV genome browser. So that would uh, open the, the, the IGV. Maybe you, uh, maybe you like, you, you, you know it you know the, the IGV and um and then it would launch the the the, the IGV and focus load the, the data the, the read data and focus automatically on this chain. Okay. Another question here. Could you tell us a bit more details on what kind of integration you can offer from the tool? Uh yes, absolutely. So we have um we come back to the presentation maybe at the beginning we have uh, three main applications that are dedicated to uh, QPCR, data analysis, microarrays, and next generation sequencing. Today, I only talked about the, the RNA-seq workflow of the, the NGS package, but we also provide different applications. And not only these, you can also integrate results from uh, SIGSOLVE, for instance, with results you had on your own, like, like own results from uh, QPCR that was not analyzed with uh, StatMiner, maybe. So this is something you can do very easily. And, uh, and uh, well, I had a, there was another uh, webinar uh, about this uh, that I presented not a long time ago. It's, it's all based in our tools here. It's called the, the Omics Office Data Integration Tool. And this is very simple. If you have, for instance, uh, uh, like differential expression from, uh, let's say, differential expression from RNA seq, like here. Okay, with uh, for every gene you have full change p value, and let's say that you have another result like this from maybe another RNA seq run or qPCR, where you also have gene IDs for change p values. So first, even if the gene ID is not exactly the same reference, you don't care because you can, with the functional uh, feature annotation tool, you can just compete and use, uh, you know, a common database of reference like Ensemble or, or Uniprot. Then you can just upload your file like this, add data table, for instance. It's just, uh, you know, a click and then you select the file you want to add. And, uh, and that will be another table in your project. Last to integrate these two, you, you go to the Omics Office Data Integration panel here, and that will be data integration. And if you launch this tool, well, you just select the first table, so that will be this one, then the second table, the one you uploaded, and you, uh, and you go to the comparison. And the comparison module is uh, looking, for the looking at the correlation of the, of the fault change and p-value from the set of from the one table and the other one. Basically, just to look at correlations and, and look at consistency uh, between the different technologies. So that you can validate, you can have, uh, you know, false positive, false negative, depending on the, the p-value you, you set up, you consider. So it's all, it's, you can do it in 10 minutes. You know, it's very simple. Okay, are there, are there uh, other questions? No, no other questions. Okay. All right. So, uh, well, Jonathan, I think we can uh, we can uh, finish the, the 
decision now. Uh, no, no other question. Okay. All, thank you very much for attending. We appreciate your time. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, have a look at the tool, uh, integromix.com, and look for the, the six All right. We'll, we'll keep in touch. If you have any further questions, even offline, we would uh, address that. Thank you, Jonathan. Thanks, thanks for, for setting up everything. Bye, Thank everyone.